brand new venue welcomes the Speed World Challenge Championships today. It's the Autobahn Grand Prix presented by Mazda, the sixth round of the World Challenge Touring Cars at the Autobahn Country Club in Joliet, Illinois, a brand new track. Folks, as we said, it's new to the series. It's new to everybody. Tom Natchew, take us around. Well, it's new to me too, Greg Creamer. I've only had one lap around here, but we can see from Tony Rivera's Tax Masters Porsche, we're going to speed this up double time because a lap in a GT car already takes two minutes and 30 seconds. As you can see through turn two, we've got a big section here that's going to take some rhythm. Now, they said around Audubon at the end of the weekend that you're going to need to work these corners as if you're planning for three more ahead of where you're going. This is a very fast section as we come down through here into two what appear to be 90 degree corners on the map but there are more sweepers on the map even this sharp left hander now onto this long bit here which is going to set up a passing zone towards the end of the braking area and then a quick right left and then we get the yump who builds a jump into their track? Well, the people here at Audubon do, and you can see Tony Rivera is just getting it over it there. The more right you go over that jump, the more air you get. And when you say racetrack and air at the same time, how can that be a bad thing? Another sweeping right-hander onto another passing opportunity here as we get into the left. Now this big carousel, reminiscent in a way of mid-Ohio, sets you up onto the front straightaway. Of course, the front straightaway is a lot shorter. Qualifying always ends with a coin toss. We're here at Audubon Country Club for the Mazda Touring Car round number six. Jason Saney, Eric Foss, Kuna Whitmer, Peter Cunningham, and Charles Espenlaub. Jason Saney, you have the pull. You flip the coin. If it's if you call it right in the air, you keep the pull. If you're wrong, the grid inverts. Go for it. Tails it is. Jason Saney, you keep the pull. It's yeah. very important for you to do well here uh, because of the Mazda sponsorship, but it must be a monkey off your back. Oh, it is for sure. You know, I was more nervous about this than the lap. Uh, this first time I've gotten a chance to do this this, uh, this year. But, uh, you know, somebody said Tails was running cold recently, so I figured I'd try it out. Uh, but, you know, just a great day today. Uh, TriPoint gave me a great car. You know, great to put the car on the pole for Mazda, and uh, we're looking forward to an awesome race tomorrow. Jason Sandy keeps the pole here at Audubon Country Club. Here's Richard Fisher, dealer principal for the Mazda Auto Barn stores. From all of our friends at Mazda and Optima Batteries, gentlemen, start your engines. And a great field of touring cars come to life. A lot on the line in this race. One, a brand new track. First time this has ever held a pro event, as a matter of fact. Two, some close points championship, both for driver and manufacturer, which everybody will tell you is key. And uh, some of the drivers really like this track. Pierre Kleinubing, four-time champion, not so much. Well, Jason Saney likes it, and after all, this whole thing has been presented by Mazda, and we want to give a big shout-out to the Mazda guys for bringing us to a brand-new track. And here's a little different perspective on the track. We've got a whole bunch of onboard shots, courtesy of our camera partner, Chase Cam. These all happen to be GTs by the look of the draw. We'll see them coming on a little later on, Greg. And when we come back, we will have the start of this race and tell you who's in it. And welcome back to the sixth round of the World Challenge Touring Car Championship, the Audubon Grand Prix, presented by Mazda here at the beautiful Audubon Country Club. Take a look at the starting lineup. Mazdas at their home event, if you will, sweep the front row. Then the two Acuras for real-time racing, Kuno Whitmer and Peter Cunningham, who is fastest in practice. We take a look at row three, Charles Esmolov, who's had some great momentum lately, and Pierre Kleinubing, as we said, struggling just a little bit on this track. Then the Subaru of Andrew Aquilani, and then the fastest of the BMWs, Seth Thomas. Row 5 is all BMWs from the uh, Bimmer World Gear Wrench team. James Clay, team owner, and Nick Isayan coming off his best finish ever, fourth at the Glen. Joel Weinberger, a founding member here at the uh, Audubon Country Club, and also Robert Roth completing the field. Great field. Red lights are on. When they go out, we're underway with 17 laps of racing. Here we go. Saney looks like he got a good start. A little bit of wheel spin there for Foss. He wisely moves over to protect his line, and that shuts out Kuno Whitmer. The field streaming into this triple apex turn one. What a start by Andrew Aqualande in that Subaru WRX. Actually gets tires onto the grass to use that all-wheel drive and get going. Look at Pierre Kleinubing putting a couple of tires onto the grass too, Greg. Well, it's happening everywhere. Aqualani in that maroon-colored 
WRX, obviously, uh, all-wheel drive, putting that to great effect. And then the field packing up behind him, the 73 right there of Charles Espinola. But up front, Saney from his second career pole leads teammate Eric Foss. A gap already opening up to Whitmer and some side-by-side -side action as we go back, take a look at this replay. You see James Clay following Seth Thomas down in here, and you see the WRX go steaming down the inside. But there's one of the Mazdas. I believe that's uh, Charles Espinola blocking up the BMW as they go one, two, three, right here where the road seems to get very narrow. This track so technical in so many ways. 19 corners, not a lot of long straights. It's a track that is well suited to all-wheel drive. And for some reason here with these changes of direction, the front-wheel drive cars really looking very strong as well. And it shows right now four of them up front with Aquilani in the all-wheel drive Subaru 5th. Take a look at Akuno Whitmer here. He's getting some pressure from behind from the number one car of Peter Cunningham. And Eric Foss able to keep up with the number 74 car of Jason Saney. Greg, Eric Foss just needs a break. He is driving so well this year, but it's been a lot of little things that have kept him out of the front running. Boy, and right there, it looked like Petey Cunningham just gave his... Uh Young charge, Kuno Whitmer, a little bit of a tap just to let him know he was there. And talking about Foss, uh, he's had tremendous speed, a couple of pulls, just had some bad luck in the races. And one thing right now, this Manufacturers Championship, Tom, we alluded to it, a scant three points coming into this weekend separating the Mazda boys and the Acura boys at this point. And these drivers will tell you, yeah, the Drivers' Championship is big, but they're not racing without these manufacturers. And they are really cognizant of manufacturer points. So Foss may hound Saney, but he's certainly not going to do anything rash. And, of course, Saney is leading the Drivers' Championship, so that's very important. And in that brace of Acuras in back, it's Cunningham who's leading the Drivers' Championship. So it's kind of flipped around. Kuno Whitmer is aware of that. At some point, he's going to want to let Cunningham by so he can stay competitive with Jason Saney as we're in round 6 of 10. Well, you mentioned Foss, obviously, in that championship chase. He's well back. He's in seventh and out of it, really, compared to this guy, Jason Saney, up front. So he's going to play rear gunner, I think, absolutely, and help him out. And right now, they're just drafting each other, using each other, trying to draw away, and it seems to be working. Aquilani there in the Subaru, sort of a, a lone soldier right now all by himself, then more of the Acuras and another of the Mazdas, and then the three BMWs that had such strong runs at the most recent round of Watkins Glen. Now, Petey Cunningham. And this may be the moment you're thinking about. And Cunningham got a great run down to the inside. And as you said, Tom, Kuno, if he could have kept in front, would have. But when Petey made the move, he certainly wasn't going to slam the door. He just let him slide through. Well, these three BMWs have a problem in the form of Charles Espenlob. Charles Espenlob did not get the greatest of starts, and he's trying to consolidate his race right now. But right now, he's being a big annoyance to Seth Thomas, who seems to have the speed, but can't move up. Well, it's interesting. Both the Real Time and the TriPoint teams have tested here at Audubon. Bimmer World hasn't. And then they come into this track, which is not friendly to changes of direction for a rear-wheel drive car. Beautiful replay here, Tom. Classic late braking. Yeah, and on second thought, Greg, I'm going to say that uh, Kuna Whitmer did make the move to get out of his way. Now the number one car in Peter Cunningham can go after this pair of Mazdas. Meanwhile, let's go back and take a look at the launch. We have been chatting a little bit about the great start that Andrew Aquilani was able to put together with that all-wheel drive Subaru. Well, he just uh, gets a great launch. He's got nowhere to go, so he says, well, I'll go on the grass and see where that gets me. He's able to go straight by Espenlob and then tuck in behind this group here. But right there, Pierre Kleinhubing gets a little bit nuts, and Andrew Aquilante just checks up on the throttle a little bit, thinking, I don't want to lose this in the first corner. Well, the WR, and that does stand for World Rally, doesn't it? So putting that to good use, what the heck? Well, why not? And after all, you, you got all that grip, you might as well use it. A little less grip for Pierre Kleinu as, as he went sliding off the track. You talked about the rear-wheel drive BMWs. We had an opportunity to catch up with Seth Thomas just a little while before the race. It is halfway through the season. It's a long season. We have five races left. This will be you know, the first of the five. And... The main thing for us is to focus, put our heads down, score some points for BMW, score some points for, uh, for the Drivers' Championship and go for it. And it's, it's really just stay focused the rest of this season. Well, the next round at Mid-Ohio is the site of that team's first ever win in 2007. So a good look to the end of the season for them. And here's a good look at our Toyota Tires leaderboard as we have completed lap five of 17 here in World Challenge Touring round six at Autobahn. And Aquilani is on the move. 
Welcome back to the Audubon Country Club in Joliet, Illinois, for the sixth round of the World Challenge Touring Cars, the Audubon Grand Prix, presented by Mazda and controlled by Mazda at the moment. Up front, Saney and Foss continue to put on a bit of a clinic. Even after Petey Cunningham was able to sneak around teammate Kuno Whitmer, he has not been able to do anything with this duo up front. They are flat hooked up, Tom. They really are, and Jason Saney has got this place figured out. As you can see, he is uh, easily cutting the laps that he's cutting. Doesn't really have much worry right behind him because, as you say, he's got his teammate playing gunner. But they are very aware of exactly where Peter Cunningham is, not just by the pit boards, but on the radio virtually all of the time. So Jason Saney is settling into a race pace. They say that this kid had ice in his veins as he came up through the MX-5 Cup, and he's showing that to us now, Greg. Absolutely great drive through Ray Hall Corner and then up through the turn they call the kink and then into that complex, the two snug right-handers into the left. And Petey Cunningham is uh, amping it up just a little bit. His lap times are starting to drop, and I think maybe as he's burned a little fuel off, uh, he is starting to feel that accurate really coming good just a little bit. He's got a lot of ground to make up, though, with that great effort up front by Saney and Foss at this point. And just look at Foss, tucked right in, not making any attempt to pass, which would slow them both down. These guys uh, have this figured out. You know, the TriPoint team has done such a great job in developing these cars. They cause a lot of excitement at the racetrack. You see that inside wheel always coming up just a little off the ground, making a little smoke in the corners, and now we've got a serious problem with one of the real-time cars. That's number 43, Joel Weinberger, who uh, it's his first start in this uh, category. First start driving one of these types of cars. As I said, he's a founding member of the club, and as such, I uh, wanted to give it a go here. It really has been acquitting himself quite well, but just uh, exceeded the limit just a little bit here. Uh, and look at this cut and thrust action as we're seeing it. Boy, suddenly for Aqualani, one car, two car, three cars starting to apply the pressure. Now Seth Thomas all over the back of Aqualani. I wonder if Aqualani's in a bit of trouble, Tom. He looks a little conflicted. Doesn't, he doesn't know whether to race these guys or let them go by. Aqualani definitely an issue with that car as four cars have been able to get by him. You know, we had an opportunity to catch up with Andrew and talk a bit before the race. Oh, it's been great. The, the Subaru has been awesome, and we've been working on it, you know, since Sebring to, to make it better. And it's just been a load of fun racing in World Challenge and excited to be here. So we'll see what happens. Reports coming in from pit lane now that the car is overheating. There is an overheating problem with that car. And Andrew Aquilani is talking to his crew chief and father, Joe. What should we do? Should we stay out here or, and, and try to run this thing? I don't think it's going to go away, Greg. My guess is that they're going to uh, try to save the engine rather than try to push this issue too much. But just as I say that, he goes by pit lane and goes for another lap. Yep, and as a result, though, 36 of James Clay goes slicing down underneath. And this car, one thing it is known for, if you watch the early rounds of the championship, it has great power, but it also carries a little bit of weight. And uh, with that overheating issue, if that power goes away, it's understandable the car is going to start falling down the order. It relies on that power to uh, drive that all-wheel drive and that weight through the turns here. Meanwhile, we go up to this little scrap that is continuing to be a good one between Kleinubing, Espenlob. Right there is the 73 of Espenlob with Kleinubing just in front. Then the two Beamers from uh, Beamer World, Seth Thomas and Clay. And I'll tell you what, this is a good scrap right here. Espenlob starting to really feel the heat from the 38 of Seth Thomas. Seth currently the only multiple winner in the season. Of course, if Saney can hang on, he would tie that as well. Meanwhile, these two Mazas up here both listening to smooth jazz on the radio. They don't have a care in the world as they look back to Peter Cunningham. We see him pop into the screen right there. That's a long distance back at Audubon. I know it's a long course. I know there's 19 corners. But making up a tenth or two here has proved very difficult through practice and qualifying for all of these touring cars. Getting back to Weinberg, he's doing a great job in the car. But driving one of these touring cars, as anybody will tell you, you get out of a, a, a showroom stock car into, into one of these touring cars... It is very, very difficult to do. So Weinberg is doing a fantastic job straight into the box. He certainly is. And one thing I wanted to mention about Saney was that this, as I said, is a team that tested here. They said they had a great setup. They got slower and slower through practice, he said, because we tweaked ourselves right out of the sweet spot in the car. 
He said, we had great data. We threw the original data back in the car, picked up two seconds over their practice pace in qualifying, his first outlap, slammed it on pole, and not a big surprise that he's been able to hang on like this. That car in qualifying, he got out of it and said, it was magic. Oh, boy, boy. You test yourself into a two-second deficit. You know, you just had one of those bad days. Very, very difficult to actually come up with a different setup on a track you've never been to before. And, of course, there has been rain in the area. They may have tested when they had some rubber down. But the last couple of nights, we've had remarkable thunderstorms. And uh, last night, we had an unbelievable one. So this track is green. May have changed the setup. No matter. These two uh, Mazdas are still pulling away. And this is the best fight on the track, as you see Pierre Kleinubing hauling around Charles Espenlob. And I have an instinct that number 38 car of Seth Thomas just a little bit faster than Espenlob. But catching Charles is one thing. Passing him, well, that's a horse of a completely different color. Indeed, absolutely superb battle. And you talk about this track. It is a track that is uh, needing grip to start with in general. Oh, and Seth Thomas is suddenly slowing, big time slowing and uh, obviously has some sort of an issue. And, Tom, you just talked about being quicker than Espenlob. He was all over Espenlob, hounding him big time. But something has gone awry, and he pulls off track. And uh, that's not in a great area. Uh, see what happens here. Meanwhile, there's Kleinubing, Espenlob, and a real loose James Clay, who uh, maybe lost his reference point. And Tom is out there and suddenly just flat tracking it just a little bit. Our Toyota Tires leaderboard. And there you see Aqualani in the pits. That overheating issue is a bad one. And also, we've got a yellow on the track for Seth Thomas. We'll be back. Welcome back to the Autobahn Grand Prix presented by Mazda, and we are ready for the first ever double file restart for the touring cars. The green is out. Saini does a nice job, but look at Petey Cunningham. The nose down underneath Eric Foss. Oh, Saini floats just a little bit wide. Foss, as a result, swings way out wide. We have one of the real-time cars dirt tracking it, and right there, Pierre Kleinhuben gets into a shoving match with Eric Foss. Eric Foss goes well wide of the Marshall stand and now adjusting the instruments. His target acquisition set to number 42 and he just misses him. He wanted to come back on the track and settle that with Pierre Kleinhuben. I don't know, I'm a hockey fan. It seemed to me that Kleinhuben's elbow just a little high as they went into the corner. Yeah, it was a hip check, wasn't it? For sure. And unfortunately for Foss, Tom, once again, the bad luck in the race. There it Most goes. of it, absolutely none of his doing continues. Big loose moment there. That, again, behind the uh, marshalling stand, that's the number 43 of Weinberger. I've actually flagged at that marshal stand and watched a car do that. It gets your attention. I would imagine it would, getting missed by that on all sides. Now we know why the Armco goes all the way around him. Here's the way it settles out. Jason Saney being hunted down now by Peter Cunningham. This whole thing is different now without a wingman to fly. And there, as you look behind him, there is Pierre Kleinubing. Meanwhile, James Clay came out of this okay. He's following Charles S. Espenlob. Let's take another look at this replay. As you see uh, Kleinubing go door handle to door handle with Eric Foss, he gets back out into the track. Foss comes out just behind him. Here's a look from Foss's point of view. He's going to come onto the track at right angles, and holy smoke, that was close. Very close. And then here is Weinberger getting it completely crossed up. A nice save but scoots him off to the left as they come out of turn number four. And, uh, boy, you can see some of the grass clippings packing up into the radiators there. That's going to be something to keep an eye on. And meanwhile, with this caution, that big deficit that Petey had to the two Mazdas has now evaporated. And Petey right now, with a chance to cool those tires off just a little bit, is now going to mount as furious a charge as he can on that auto barn Mazda. Well, this boils down to the whole championship here. Jason Saney leading Peter Cunningham in here is a bit of a shot here with Eric Foss making up some room on Kuda Whitmer. Eric Foss has got his head down. He'd like to get back up to the front. That's unlikely. But meantime, he's going to score as many points for the Manufacturers Cup as he possibly can. And it looks like he's dispatched Kuno Whitmer, Greg. Well, he can stay put on the outside, and he does. Boy, Kuno just ran in way hot, had those brakes lit up, smoke roiling off the tires, and uh, Foss jumping on that opportunity. Meanwhile, let's jump back up to the front of this one. There is Saney, then Cunningham, then a little gap to Kleinubing, then Espenlob, and then James Clay. And Clay having a very solid run right now. And then this scrum, including that resurgent 
Eric Foss and uh, the leading contender in the rookie championship right now. So he's looking after his own interests as well as Mazda's. You know, the uh, Seth Thomas car came over there and that little piece of road that you can just see, the guys from Pit Lane ran over there and able to figure out it was just a hose clamp that had come off and really shut down his airbox. But if Seth Thomas had to fix that, he'd have been okay because the crew touched it. Cars disqualified. They decided to just park that car. No points to carry on. They're not going to score any points anyway. And Mid-Ohio's only in two weeks. Boy, it's been that kind of a season for Seth. Wicked quick. He gets the two wins, but he also broke at the start, had a half-shaft failure. So it's it's feast or famine for Seth, and it's been a frustrating roller coaster ride in terms of the points for him. But for Saney up front, it's been just the opposite, consistently scoring points. Petey Cunningham, after a tough start at Sebring, breaking in this new rules Acura has had that come good and has obviously put together some great runs, including a win at Mosport. But uh, Saney is the guy who has been just Mr. Consistency all season long. That's how you win championships. Yeah, man. I think the break in period for uh, the ride for Cunningham and Klein Newing is over. Those cars, <laughs> they've obviously got a win in the thing. And uh, this is a new rules car in Saney, or an old rules car in Saney, racing a new rules car in Cunningham. Looks like SCCA Pro Racing got it right again. These cars very evenly matched. It's a great battle. And it's great to see these guys out in clear air fighting for the championship and fighting for the battle in this race out on their own without teammates to help them sort it out. There's that jump you were talking about up and over the rise. Basically, this course has two loops, the north and south loop, and it's the connector is where that bit of a jump is. Then it falls, Tom, into my favorite corner on the track by far, turn 13, a fall-away right-hander all the way to the apex, and you climb up into two more left and right. I call it the S's section, and that turn down through the trees is very fast, very fun, and uh, just a great place uh, on this racetrack. There's a lot of spots here. It's bumpy. It uh, doesn't have a lot of grip to start with and lots of changes of direction makes it technical. And uh, for some of these drivers, they absolutely love it. A uh, guy named Klein Ubing, though, has, has said, I like to attack corners. If you do that here, you go slow. He said, I'm not crazy about this place. Well, there's another look from Peter Cunningham. And as you say, some people like it, some people don't. And as the checkered flag flies, Jason Saney will consolidate his lead on the Drivers' Championship. Didn't do any harm to the Manufacturers' Championship either with his win here ahead of Cunningham, Klein Ubing, Espen Lobb, and James Clay. Most of the usual suspects, save uh, Eric Foss and uh, Seth Thomas, up there in the front. And for James Clay, his first top five in the season, but it's all about Jason Saney. Let's get down to Victory Circle. Feeling no pressure with ice in his veins the whole way. The winner of round number six, he's done it again, folks. This is Jason Saney. Thank you. All right, it's all over now, mate. Now, looking back and reflecting on this, there's a tall order. You had to do get a lot done in a very short time. Absolutely, yeah. We didn't want to see that caution for sure. Uh, TriPoint gave me an awesome car in Mazda. Just the opportunity to be here with the ladder and then with the uncertainty this year and, and Mazda stepping up to, to put this program together. To come to their race that they put together to come out uh, you know, and be at the front was our goal. And uh, you know, we wanted a couple more of them here on the podium, but uh, it felt great, that pressure at the end. Uh, I was kind of fighting a, a, a broken motor mount and trying to hold Peter off, and I felt the pressure at the end there for sure. But, uh, you know, we brought it home, and, uh, you know, Mazda just, again, results, and, and we're inching up on the manufacturer's title. We're coming for him. We'll take a look at those points in a minute. Here are the drivers standing. Saney opens it up over Cunningham. Klein Newbing penalized 10 points for that contact with Foss. Manufacturers, Mazda's win, dead even now with Acura. P.D. Cunningham. He ends up getting the Auto Week move of the race for his pass for second along with a fast lap. And when we come back to Audubon, GT Thunder about to erupt. This is Sue Erickson with the Northern Illinois Food Bank. On behalf of Black Dog Speed Shop, Northern Illinois Food Bank, and Optimum Batteries, drivers, start your engines! Let's get it on with World Challenge GT! All right, Dave Drimmy pumping it up. We are getting ready for the sixth round of the World Challenge GT Championship, the Audubon Grand Prix, presented by Black Dog Speed Shops, located just down the road a little bit. Let's get to the coin toss, see how that turned out for the qualifiers. Here at Audubon Country Club for the Black Dog Racing Northern Illinois Food Bank, round number six. James Afranis, you're on the pole. You get to flip the coin. If you call it properly in the air, you keep the pole. If not, Dino Crescentini gets the pole. It's kind of a no-lose situation. Yeah, this is a good position to be in. Go ahead. Heads. 
Heads it is. James Safranis keeps the ball. Global Motorsports Group and Stop Tech Breaks is very important that you guys do here. Also important for the championship run. Well, here we are in the second half of the season, and we're second in points. Dino and I have been working really well together, as you saw at Watkins Glen. The GMG guys have done an amazing job with the car. We found something after yesterday's practice session, actually in the brakes. It's funny, I, I talk about stop tech a lot, but it was actually the way we set up the brakes for this track, which is really hard on brakes. Car was freed up in this lap, and I knew we had to get it done in the first lap. So the GMG stop tech brake car was amazing. Todd Aki and Steve Ruiz engineering the car, great job. And we have a lot of uh, clients here in Chicago area at the Autobahn Country Club, great facility. So. We're happy to be up front and hopefully have a good race. James Safranis keeps the pole here at Audubon Country Club. Well, you know, when you get your first career pole, you really like to be able to maintain it and start up front. So that was a big moment for him. Let's take a look at the starting lineup. Safranis on pole. Randy Popes in the Volvo alongside. Tony Rivera and Andy Pilgrim in the second row. Dino Crescentini inside row three. Brandon Davis, the first of the cars who doesn't have an engine over a set of drive wheels. That tells you something about this track and the layout here. And for Safronis, the 15 bonus points in qualifying with Davis sitting back in the sixth spot. That's a huge swing there. And Tom, we have both the return of Aston Martin to World Challenge and the debut of McLaren Mercedes. Along with the debut of Spencer Pompelli, an exciting driver from the American Le Mans Series. So pleased to have him amongst these drivers here in Speed World Challenge GT. Two brand new cars, the biggest field we've seen since Sebring. Looks really good here at Audubon Country Club. It should be fantastic. And look at that beautiful field as it is laid down along this front straight. We are getting ready to go with this sixth round of the championship. And looking forward to it. And keep in mind, Tony Gaple starts 12th. He is the owner of the Black Dog Speed Shop. This one's so important for him. Lights are on. Watch for the start. We are underway. World Challenge GT at the Autobahn. Seems fitting to have a Porsche leading the way at the Autobahn. And Tony Rivera, boy, did he get a great launch up and underneath Randy Popes through turn one, heading down into turn two. Look at the margin for Safronis and Popes. Dive bomb, straight lines right to the apex. Safronis goes wide. Post is through. Drops to third in the lead coming out of turn two. Randy Post at work. Holy smoke, you'd think that things would work out for him once in a while, and this time it really did. Not the greatest of starts, but uh, along with dive bombing the Tony Rivera car and that Taxmaster's Porsche, James Safranis makes a rare error out of the marbles there in the left of turn number two, and it's all over. James uh, Safranis makes the mistake, and now we look at Eric Curran working his way up through the field. He had a pretty good start as well. But what a move by Randy Post. Yeah, Kern qualified seventh, but that big V8 torque helping out. And Randy Pope said, with all the change of direction on this track, he said, and not long straightaways, which is the one weak point for the Volvos right now, he said, if ever there was a track where we were going to be strong, it was going to be here. Now, you saw Andy Pilgrim, who had a good qualifying run. He did not get a good start. And uh, these cars, these Volvos, with those small but turbocharged engines, if you get it right, they scream off the line. If you don't, they bog down. And I think Randy nailed it. And he struggled a bit. Gunter Schaldak having a good run. He's right in behind uh, Brandon Davis. Eric Curran takes a look down the inside, but he's been working with the Trans Am stand-up Mike Borkowski, and it looks like it's really paid off for Gunter Schaldak. You talked about Andy Pilgrim's start. You see it start to happen here. He does not get into the hole well enough, and if you don't do that, you're going to lose a bunch of spots. One, two, three, four, five guys slip through Andy Pilgrim. He's going to have a busy day at the office, 18 laps to get back up to the front. And also, we saw a shot of Tim McKenzie in that number 66 Eurosport racing, the beautiful black Porsche, having a good return to the series. Very uh, good start, as well as we hop on board with Eric Kern down into one of these 19 corners. Oh, and a big loop by the number 9, Gunter Schaldock, and the Lala Motorsports Viper goes around on him. And Gunter off to the side of the track, kept it running, though, but he's going to drop to dead last. So Gunter now has a long day ahead of him, Tom. Had a good going, good thing going there, Greg, as he uh, was leading Eric Kern going in there, but just a little early on the throttle, perhaps, and Gunter Schaldock goes around. And you see every single car in the field go streaming by his windshield. That is not what you want to see out the front of a World Challenge GT car, Greg. Well, we've heard all the drivers here say grip is at a premium, whether it's touring cars or GT. And so you get a little greedy with the horsepower of these GT cars. That's the kind of thing that can happen. And look at the gap now. Because of that spin, Kern able to move up a spot. But there's a bit of a gap. And McKenzie, beautiful move down underneath Brian Kabinski. Talk about a return to the series. This Trimtex Drywall Products Chevy Corvette. Great to see this car 
back in World Challenge competition. They have struggled over the course of the years, uh, the last couple of years, but great to see them back and talk about a home event for this guy. This is great. But then you're dealing with Andy Pilgrim on the move, aren't you? He went a little bit deep. Kabinsky able to get by, and Andy Pilgrim able to challenge now as uh, Brian Kabinsky. Haven't seen him since Sebring, and what a uh, run he's having here. It's always great to see Brian. He knows he can run with these guys, and the guys who uh, tune the CRP Corvette also very good as well. Brian Kabinsky on a move here, and look at this. The only thing that's changed is that Pilgrim is out front. Hard to beat that Wiley veteran at anything he does. Well, once he was able to get moving, obviously, this Volvo is so suited to this track. Randy Post, by the way, fastest in every practice session and was surprised with the time Sophronis laid down, as was James. James said, we made a little setup change, and he said, they got a little bit of grip uh, from the previous day. Oh, and a big spin. Boy, you don't see that very Holy often. Smoke. Andy Pilgrim makes a mistake. That's almost unheard of. And hopefully he was able to keep it running. Obviously, he's going to lose a lot of time. He did. So he's moving now. We hop on board with Gunter Schalldock. And I think you're going to see Andy right in front regaining the track. So the other story, of course, is the debut of the Mercedes. The driver is Spencer Pompelli. Our paddock has been just mobbed, and it's been great. You know, the car draws a lot of attention. Uh, it's different looking than basically anything out there, and it's neat to be a part of that. So we're glad we have it here for the fans. We're glad we have it here for the series, and uh, I think we're going to have a good time with this. Been enjoying every bit of it so far, and, uh, you know, hope to do a lot more. Well, I'll tell you what, it's eye candy, but it's high-performance eye candy. The McLaren's Benz SLR 722 GT, and uh, tell you what, the Racers Group, who's the team that brought it here with Circle B Motorcars uh, as the sponsor. Unbelievable program. You can't uh, fault the Racers Group for anything they do. TRG Motorsports, a first-class organization. They got here. The car was right. It looked right. Every single decal was on it properly. And these guys are just kind of finding their way in World Challenge, and they found the right guy to drive the car as well. Normally, a Porsche specialist, Spencer Pompelli, doesn't crash and always gets the job done. Yeah, tremendous in terms of his testing and feedback. We take a look at our Toyo Tires leaderboard. Pope's leading Rivera and Crescentini. That's your podium. But look at Jeff Courtney as he has now cracked the top ten. Brian Kabinski uh, up in seventh. We take a look at the rest. And then, of course, Pilgrim way in the back along with Shaldock. Oh, and no, Tony Gaples off course. Big, long slide into the tires. Boy, thankfully, huge rows of tires there. That was a pretty solid hit. Let's go on board. You can hear his throttle stuck wide open, Greg. All four tires locked up. He had no choice. He had the wheels turned to the right. There's no way he was going to be able to avoid that. Thank goodness there's lots of tires at the end of that straightaway. So Randy Pope's leads as we get ready to take a break here. And owing to that crash, we're under caution. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Audubon Grand Prix, presented by the Black Dog Speed Shop. Sixth round of the World Challenge GT Championship. Double file restart. Leader. On your right, that is Popes, and the green flag flies. Oh, and they start fanning out. Not a long run up into this first turn. We're three abreast. So far, everybody looking okay. Oh, and contact, and Rivera spins right in the middle of the pack. Other cars involved as well. We've got cars everywhere, Tom. Holy smoke. Tony Rivera, maybe just a little bit of a punt there from the number 10 car and Brandon Davis, and that sets up a chain reaction that just keeps going as Brian Kabinsky has managed to slip through all of that carnage. And at the same time, Tom, look at Crescentini who's just plummeting down the field. He obviously has damage. And back in that battle, look at this, the battle for fourth and fifth right now. That is uh, Rob Morgan and Bill Ziegler, the Swisher Racing GMG entry. Oh, and McKinsey damages well to that left rear corner. Tom, there are a lot more cars caught up in that incident than maybe it first appeared. I can't see how we're not going to go full course yellow as uh, Brian Kabinsky has uh, been able to get through, but there's very few others who've come through unscathed. You mentioned Bill Ziegler. He's got a big problem with his wing. That's all, Caddy Wumpus. Let's take another look at this. It all starts right there as uh, the 97 car goes around. Has a big oops moment by Brandon Davis, but he has to actually go around outside in the grass Holy smoke, the Mercedes missed that number 97 car by just a little bit. We're going to have to take a look at this from some in-car camera perspectives. But now we've got uh, the number one car at the front of this thing. Like I say, I don't know how we're not going to go full course yellow. Well, they're going to have to, Tom. I mean, you can see Eric Kern has stopped the wheel and Corvette. There's Dock and the Lala Motorsports entry. Pulled off both of them near impact areas, a tough spot. But the story might be that yellow Corvette of Brian Kabinsky, his return to the series. What a return it has been. 
It's great to be back, home track at the Autobahn Country Club, uh, still trying to put the deals together for the, for the rest of the season, but um, if everything goes good here, we'll go to Road America and go from there. That's the way it always goes, Greg Kramer. Everybody's always looking for money midseason, and Brian Kabinski, I swear, if that team could be properly funded, we'd have a Corvette running up front with Eric Curran and the rest of those Wheeling Engineering guys. Well, you can see what they're capable of. What a smart move by them to come to a track to make their debut return, if you will, to the series at a track they're very familiar with where they can really show what they're capable of. However, as you see the double yellow flying, Shaldock parked off to the side. Here's our Toyo Tires leaderboard. Again, under caution, Pope's Kabinski. What a story there. And for Brandon Davis, with the problems that he had in qualifying and the issues that he thought he might face here to be up in a potential podium spot for our points leader, how huge is that, especially with James Sofronis well back in the order right now. There's James. It's that far back. Let's take a look at the restart here on board with Dino. Well, Dino Crescentini sees an opportunity to go down the inside, and he has some contact with the number one car, and he actually has some contact with the 97 as well. So that was very ambitious on Dino's part. And there you see where Kubinski got in and away. Meanwhile, on board with the 007, the Aston Martin of Nick Mancuso. Well, this is one of those deals where you look up front and you look at what you don't want to hit and drive there. He drives by the number 14 car, which is spun out on the inside. Didn't really see how James Sofronis uh, got worked out in that. But there you see Sofronis spinning as uh, we look at the front of Curran's car as Sheldock and him come off. I believe that Gunter Sheldock a little com uh, contact with the back bumper of uh, the Whelan car. Meanwhile, Pompelli, boy, smart move. You talked about how this guy can get it done. And that was about as close as it gets. But that beautiful Mer a Mercedes, and you don't want to wad that up in the first start. And he did a beautiful job of just scything through that mess. Well, I'll tell you, it's a darn good thing the Tax Masters guys didn't put two coats of paint on this because Sp Spencer Pompelli very nearly collected him. Well, as Dorsey Schrader is fond of saying, yellows beget yellows, especially when you do a double file restart. This is the type of thing that can happen. It sure is exciting. We'll be back to sort it out here at Audubon. Welcome back to the Audubon Grand Prix presented by the Black Dog Speed Shop, World Challenge GT. Another restart, this one though, single file. After the problems with that last one, they decided to err on the side of caution. And we are green, Popes leading Kabinski. Then that black Mustang, the ACS, Sun Microsystems entry. Hop on board with Andy Pilgrim behind Nick Mancuso making his debut in the series in that beautiful Lake Forest sports cars. Aston Martin and an off by Galen Beaker in the Porsche. Meanwhile, back up front, Popes leads away. And then the pack. And I'll tell you what, Tom, this second yellow, if you will, a couple of the guys who had problems early, like Sophronis, have an opportunity to try and come back up through the pack. And they're going to have to dice with some guys they don't normally see this far up front. Rob Morgan and Bill Ziegler in the fourth and fifth spot. What a great job they did. And this all pays off from the great drive that they made through that big mess in front of them. Congratulations to both those guys. As we see Dino Crescentini in his retirement, as uh, something went wrong. I know he spent some time in the pits during that yellow. Yellow, but something is ended up being terminal. Meanwhile, Volvo, leading Mustang, leading Corvette, World Challenge is all about multi marks. We got a couple of a Porsches in behind there, and there's Bill Ziegler going backwards. Gee, Greg, do you think it might have anything to do with that wing? That's got to be presenting some interesting aerodynamic effects, especially in the high-speed stuff. Morgan has gone through in the red and blue true-speed Porsche. Now Courtney goes through in the Kenda Tires entry. And here comes Nick Mancuso in that aptly numbered 007 Lake Forest Sports Cars Aston Martin. Back up front, some great racing unfolding right here in the number 47 of Rob Morgan. What a great drive he's put in as well. Wish these guys would be able to run the championship on a little bit more frequent basis. And you pointed out, Tom, the fact now that Brandon Davis has been able to get by Kabinski, and that has huge points implications as you watch Sofronis catching some huge air over the jump, trying to make his way back to the pack. I still love the fact that this track has a jump in it. It's almost like a, a Hot Wheels track. You get a jump, and all they need now is one of those loop-to-loops. Well, Tom, think about it. You got Porsches running on the Autobahn. Why not have a Flugplatz? Yeah, excellent point. And I've got time to think about it because Randy Popes has come up with a bit of a gap here over Brandon Davis, who's storming now. Volvo, Mustang, Corvette, and now Andy Pilgrim doing his best to move up. He's dicing with one of these Porsches. And, oh, the Morgan car just able to keep him at bay. The number 97 car in behind him. You know that Tony Rivera wants a piece of this. Let's take a look at Andy Pilgrim working at uh, this Porsche. And he's going to try to outbreak him right 
here. This is probably the best passing uh, zone on the track. Down into turn number one from Tony Rivera's point of view. Gets it done, and Tony Rivera will say, there's a hole, I'll have that, Greg Creamer. Yeah, Tony, smart move, opportunistic, trying to wedge his way alongside. That is uh, Rob Morgan. Now he's able to make the pass stick. And so Rivera marching his way back through the pack. Remember, he was involved in that shamazzle on that double file restart and dropped well back the order. This is huge for him. And Sophronis is also making some inroads up through the pack as well. So not a lot of time left. But there is Sophronis right there. These are all huge in terms of the points. And then that beautiful Mercedes SLR, which, by the way, stands for Sport Lecht Rennsport, which I believe is Sport Light Racing. And boy, does it. Uh-oh, Charles Morgan goes around, and uh, that's going to interrupt his progress. As you see, he's got a little bit of a hot break there. There's a little bit of a fire. That'll go out as soon as he gets going. But Charles, the father, Rob, the son, have been running great in World Challenge, and you can tell they've got some Porsche Cup experience because they know how to stay out of trouble. And the best place to stay out of trouble? Up front. And Randy Popes has been there from virtually the beginning. Remember, off the start, slipped from second to third, but out of turn two was leading. And that has paid off huge dividends. It's kept him clear of all the mess. And look at Andy Pilgrim now, fourth. Behind him, Rivera up into fifth. Then Morgan. Then Sophronis up into seventh. Then the Mercedes into eighth. That's huge. That was that team's goal. And you see the Aston Martin in tenth. Both those teams in their debuts said a top ten finish. We'd be over the moon. They're there. Absolutely great job. Here's the Toyo Tires leaderboard. Popes, Davis, Kubinski. What a story if he can hang on for a podium. And keep in mind, you see lap 14 of 16 scheduled for 18 or 15 minutes. Because of all those cautions, time has been shortened, as has the lap count. The last two laps coming up. Welcome back to the Audubon Grand Prix presented by the Black Dog Speed Shop as we are into the final lap of the sixth round of the World Challenge GT Championship. Randy Popes has been able to just ease away, open that margin up over Brandon Davis. Brian Kabinski, one more lap to hang on over a driver, the caliber of Andy Pilgrim. If he can do it, what an accomplishment for Kabinski. And speaking of Pilgrim, with him now up into the top five as well in fourth, the Capex Volvo team scoring some good manufacturer's points. And remember, Andy came in here third in the Drivers' Championship. That's huge, along with Rivera and Sophronis, both of those guys in the Porsches helping their Drivers' Championship points, but also stemming the flow, if you will, for Porsche in this one. And uh, that's very important indeed. Well, you know, you look at Andy Pilgrim and Randy Post. They both came off the trailer fast. Andy was fraught with problems throughout this race. Shows what a veteran he is and how the man can get the job done. At one point, he was dead last, now all the way up into fourth. The man knows how to score points. We've seen that over his career. He understands that process. And for Randy Popes, multiple-time champion, hard to believe that this if he can hang on, will be his first win of 2009. And especially when you consider he didn't even race at Sebring as this team was being developed. And this was the track that they thought they might be able to get it done. And Randy Popes has been nothing short of brilliant. Well, as you say, Randy Popes, he's always fast at a brand new track. That gives him a distinct advantage. When we talked to him in the paddock after he was fastest in both practice sessions, he went right back to autocross, all you folks. And oh no, there's Spencer Pompelli. I thought it was a spin. Greg, that looks like a retirement. Yeah, it certainly does. He's just coasted to a stop. Don't know what the issue might be, and that is a shame. But tell you what, there is no question. You heard Spencer talk about what a draw that car has been in the paddock. It looks even better at speed on the track. It looks like it's going 100 miles an hour sitting still. And on the track, even better. We hope they are back. They are planning to run a few more races this year. That's great news indeed. And uh, I think one of the nice things for Kabinski is that Tony Rivera is actually starting to pressure Pilgrim a little bit, and that may be just what the doctor ordered for Kabinski. Well, Brian Kabinski uh, doesn't need much help. He's very fast. He's been fast all weekend, but it was his drive through the uh, that big crash there that really consolidated this for him. But looking at uh, Randy Popst right now, he looks in his rearview mirror, sees a determined uh, championship points leader, Brandon Davis there. He knows he's got him covered too. Takes a long time to get a lap here, but by now, Randy comes sweeping through this big right-hander. He knows he's got her done. And Randy Popes looks as the checker flies. He has got his first win of the season. Rest of the field coming through. Davis gets a second. Huge for the points. Kubinski, what a celebratory third. Pilgrim and Rivera round out the top five. Sophronis, Morgan, Courtney, and the rest of the field. But let's get down to victory circle. Randy Popes, always an exciting interview. Let's hear from him. Well, on the start, 
that Volvo, it's either going to go or it's not, and it didn't really want to go today. So around the first corner, I got a good run off the corner, and I figured now or never on Tony Rivera, and I dive-bombed him. And up ahead, James Safrone has got loose in the other Porsche, and all of a sudden, we're in the lead. And Randy in the lead, that's tough to overcome. Let's take a look at our driver's championship points. Davis stretches it out over Safrona's Pilgrim Rivera. Pope's now into the top five. And in the manufacturer's championship, Porsche still leads, but Ford closing and Volvo joining the fight without doubt. The Auto Week move of the race, watch the yellow Corvette of Brian Kabinski. Boy, did he thread a needle. If he knew what he was doing, that was brilliant. And if he didn't, you got to be lucky to be good. Well, and he was both, no question. So... Randy Popes gets the win in GT. Saney and Touring Cars next round. Mid-Ohio, join us there. Until then, take care, everybody.